And we're live, streaming live to you from the footsteps of New York City. We are Music Matters with Jason Tran, and we're delighted that you can join us for a unique podcast community, where we explore the issues and challenges in the performing arts world as seen through the eyes of distinguished colleagues. Thank you so much for joining us. We've just recently hit 1,300 subscribers, and we're so excited. Please remember to hit that subscribe button and pound that bell icon for the most up-to-date information on upcoming guests and topics. We're just about to announce a very exciting uh, list of really distinguished colleagues for April and May and June, and we're really excited. And um, it's been such a pleasure to grow with you. And uh, please reach out and use the chat function, ask questions of our guests. We'd love it to interact with you. It makes the show so much more interesting. We have a great guest today, Mr. Eli Villanueva, who has been at LA Opera for 16 years as the part of the or lead, leader of the LA Opera Connects program. He is a distinguished uh, director, musician, educator, and also a wonderful composer who's written one-act operas. He's written choral works and everything in between. And we're delighted he can join us today. Welcome, Eli. Thank you so much. It's so glad to be talking with you once again. It's been a while. <laughs> Well, every time we talk, it's special. You are such a such a gifted artist, and you give so much to young people. I mean, uh, watching you work and working with you on those projects we did at the Count Basie Theater was really um, amazing to see how much you can get out of talented young people. You really are a magnificent stage director. Well, gosh, th thank you. I, I um, yeah, I feel very. Um, Lucky. I feel very lucky that I'm that I'm able to actually be me, um, which is still a child. Uh, but with all of my experience over the decades, um, I could spread that knowledge in a childlike fashion to young individuals who are generally ages eight through 17, 18. And uh, it, it's been uh, a really fun journey. Uh, a really fine uh, expanse of my knowledge base. And I, I'm very lucky to be able to work with these individuals. Some of them have turned into really quite fine artists themselves. So I'm... Um, well, all you have to do is get turn on that uh, to teach them what opera is. So many students and uh, young people today don't know much about opera and they don't know that they're going to love it. And once they, once they engage with it at the level that you teach them, I'm sure that's a very... Uh, that's the first step on a long way of, of a whole lifetime engagement with the art form. Well, as a resident stage director at LA Opera, it's part of my job to actually go out into the public schools and actually be first contact in the world of opera to these students. And for the longest time, uh, yeah, they did not know what opera was and uh, a lot of times if you ask them what it was they would give you uh, pictures of you know large individuals with spears and and horns, horns. coming out of the yes the helmet and it, it oh, that always came up and so i would go out there and uh, basically start informing them that we like to describe opera for them is a story that is set to music and we start sharing stories for them. And when you take away the fine art aspect of it and really focus on the story and how the music informs the stories and, and lets them know how to feel, uh, they really find it very interesting and it's very accessible at that point to them. And it is not something that is is you know out there for somebody to to uh look at it's something that's actually can be involved inside their own hearts and so we've actually found some people who are now devotees to la opera's audience and they want to take part in every uh po possible opportunity that they can find at la opera because we do yeah, we do have lots of things for the community to come in and take part, whether it's for education or if they want to take part in a production with main stage. We have ways to to work with main stage artists and they could be part of the chorus and part of the acting uh, core on stage with them. So we, we have lots of opportunities for people who who like the to be surrounded by the art form, even if they're not professional opera singers themselves. 
I think it's so important to cultivate that next generation of opera lovers. Um, that's so it's, it becomes even more important. I mean, there's there's this this um, often prevailing view that opera is this um, is it lead art form that's not accessible to average people, and that couldn't be more wrong. No, I I definitely agree, and I I think that's what's kept me working for such a long time because. Um, yeah, when I come up to a kid in the fifth grade, I do not actually behave as an elite individual in the fine arts. And so, uh, and then I start telling them stories and I, I have quite a unique way. I start jumping around and I start portraying people in a cartoon-like fashion. And they're thrown off by this individual who is an operatic director. They, they yeah, they, they actually connect in a very different fashion and then they find the love of opera and the stories. And in, and when we invite them to the main stage, then they really get hit by what opera can offer them. I remember when I was a chorus master with the New Jersey State Opera, I just remember sitting, I was um, I was the chorus master for Il Trovatore and we did a 45 minute uh, opera, you know, it was a 45 minute dress rehearsal for the, the public school students of Newark and they get bussed in and they come and I was really nervous. I'd never done that before. And I'm like, oh boy, this is a kind of a, you know, and they loved it. They were quiet. I mean, they, they were like, they were so enraptured to hear the live voices and to meet some of the people after the show. And I said a few words and I, I, I was, it just made a difference to me. And I got to talk to some of the students afterwards as the chorus master. It was really special to watch them engage with something they'd never heard before. It, it's very true. I, I would trust that probably their teachers did some good homework and informed them of what they were about to see and informed them of the story so that they have an easier time following along. And I think that some of the great uh, companies throughout the world are actually sharing these stories, whether it's um, in lectures before the show or you know going out to, into the schools and and sharing these stories before they come in. And that's what actually helps them enjoy themselves. Hopefully they'll learn that if they come a second time by themselves or with the parents or with you know other family members, that if they if they find out a little bit about the story, if they find out about the thematics and when uh the the history of when this Thing was written, they are going to find some fascinating things in the production that they, they will enjoy. Yeah, there's nothing like those universal human themes that makes opera so special. That, and when, this, when people learn that they can engage with that, that it's not this kind of distant, mysterious uh, thing shouted in another language at you, <laughs> that it can be really very interesting and, and striking. Yeah, I, I've... Um... I found that even for myself, that that was the interesting thing that got me hooked when I was 12 years old into opera is actually, well, first of all, I, I was a choir boy um, in a professional boys choir. New York City Opera would come uh, to LA and they would bring over maybe uh, six productions in residence that they had, and they would do those for five weeks in at the music center. So they, they needed children for some of their operas and they hired the choir that I was in. And so my first one was La Boheme. And they, they brought me into rehearsal for the first act and I was a boy that brought in logs and I threw it down and then would go to Chouinard and ask for money. And I'd not heard an opera singer ever before, except in recordings. And so when I, when I stood in front of him, I was probably about two and a half feet away from him and he sang his line La Banga di Francia and it was so intense that I fell over backwards. <laughs> the director was quite concerned and asked if I was okay and I was like uh, no yeah I I'm fine and rehearsal uh, continued on but I was hooked at that point and 
fortunately at that point security wasn't as tough so that a 12 year old boy can actually come to rehearsals and sit in rehearsal room three and watch the rehearsals continue on and you know i i was watching mimi was catherine malfitano oh, wow and watching how she would sing in relationship to all of, all of these other singers and how personable they were when they were off the stage. And it was really a lot of fun to get into all of these stories and hear the backstories. And, and that, I, I was hooked. I was hooked with La Boheme. Were your parents musical? Uh, my father was a nightclub singer and my mother was a very shy actress. Um, and uh, could not really handle it. So she actually went into the medical field and my father wanted more money. So he went into general construction. And so I learned from my mother about germs and I learned from my father about putting wood together. And uh, yeah, and but the personalities that they have actually went on to us. My mother is a great storyteller and it kind of like went on to me. And uh, yeah, I, I uh, like to figure out how to tell an interesting story and, and to keep kids uh, engaged in, in a story, you know, that way. All perfect for a budding young director, someone who's going to, all those, those pieces come together and over time. And now, um, what was the next step in your development? I know you became a singer. You've, you've been a singer your whole career as well, as well as a composer, and you've done so many different things. So what was your next engagement with music? Um, af after being a choir boy, I, I worked with them as a junior counselor in their training programs. And I also... Uh, became the assistant to the stage director. And basically I, I learned everything I know from this one stage director who would tell stories uh, even about rehearsals that were, he, he would, he studied in Bayreuth. And so he, he was learning these Wagner operas from <laughs> descendants of Wagner himself wow. and, and, uh, and he would be uh, telling us all of these interesting things. And we, we got to know these stories. And fortunately I've been working with him long enough that he allowed me to, to actually share in some of the responsibilities. So uh, two hours of, of uh, physical exercises with uh, ballet, you know, stage dancing. I think you've seen me run some of those. I have. I was going to ask about that. That's incredible. Wow. Yes. Uh, I actually uh, got that from my teacher and uh, I still use those exercises because one of the things, if somebody really wants to be on stage, there is training um, and it has to be in such a way where it is something that is innate within you. And so if you're going to be a child working on this, you have to prepare your physical body to be on stage, to stand on stage, to move and walk across on stage. And everybody in every show, there are certain things that you're going to have to learn. A grapevine, you know, you cross and step, uh, a box step. You got to learn how to waltz. You got to, you know, learn how to slowly walk. Opera is long and we have to walk slow at times. You got to know how to control your body so that you're constantly in balance. And then that physical technique needs to then incorporate into your singing technique. So how do you ground yourself to be the singer and yet still look uh, appropriate on stage for the character that you are for whatever period that you are supposed to be because a person of the 1970s is very different from a person of the 1790s and so we have to know how to 
how to carry our bodies in these different ways. So I start with, you know, wax on, wax off type of exercises, which then transfer into what one does on stage. And hopefully the body becomes more aware of that and how to ground yourself to be a singer and know those times when you have to ground, when you have to move and how to move so that you don't trip or so that you move with energy so that you are demanding attention while you're on stage and you demand that attention from every single member of the cast every from the leads to the ensemble players i mean i've i watched you teach them and to so you know to really direct them to what your motion is to think about that and um i was, I was so impressed to see that now, having that mentor model from the old school, that is such an important part of opera is being around people who are in the field for in, in some of those incredible places, Bayreuth, uh, La Scala, and absorbing those things. And how incredible you get to give these same lessons to these young people. Uh, yes, I, I do feel that one must learn from a master uh, one must gain certain skills from masters. Uh, if you're starting off in a career in the fine arts, it is best to work with fantastic people around you so that you are constantly learning. I think even the masters are constantly learning from those who are around them. And you, your taste, if you're starting off with your skill set as a child, starting off with people with great skills and great art and great finesse and a great eye, uh, you will start to gain from that knowledge, from that experience, and it will affect you and your taste and your desire for better things from yourself. And so, yes, having a master around you as you are learning in whatever way you can that that's the even if you're just watching it on youtube and watch the masters be on youtube fine do it the students today have so much opportunity they do need someone to guide them through that process because there's so much on youtube the good the bad and the ugly obviously <laughs> but finding what is valuable in those lessons is really important i know i have to always direct my students towards videos that i want them to see try this one maybe and then uh, given the parameters of what the best is right that's <laughs> very important it's it's very true and i i completely understand that uh, i am going to work primarily with people who are just starting their their journey as an artist and uh, a lot of times what i'm giving them is the foundation of what they can before they start going to uh, a main stage, before they start working with the elites of, of their careers. I'm Hopefully I am giving them a foundation from which they can catapult into the next thing. So we, yeah, it, it's, it's a, I feel it to be a big responsibility, but, but one that I, I try to make it as engaging or fun as possible so that they are you know uh they are willing to to open themselves up to to this type of learning because i i'm sure you know it is hard to actually be out there and make mistakes and try this and try that and uh and one of the things that I tell them is, you know, go ahead and make mistakes. The first mistake, you know, that is a learning experience. The second and third mistakes, okay, you better fix that. But the, the first few mistakes, you, you know, th that's how we learn by, by the stumbling and stuff. So um, that goes for all of us. We're constantly learning, constantly adapting. And uh, we'll talk about the COVID period, but we've all learned so much of this period. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we've learned so much. Some of it is, uh, you know, I never thought I, at this part of my career, I'd be learning these type of things. Everyone's become a television producer during this period. <laughs> uh, yeah. Or at least some type of creator within this television production type of, of world that we've created um but it it does it is a challenge for those of us who are so used to being in ensemble working with people face to face 
actually feeling that sense, feeling one another's breath. I don't know, feeling their energies. Um, I'm from California, so we feel other people's energies around us. And, uh, and yeah, it, it has been a challenge now doing it in this fashion. Um, fortunately, at least in this sense, we can communicate by what we see. So we can see your reaction. We can see, uh, even if it's not instantaneous, because it takes time to get through wires to a hub to then get into somebody else's apartment or whatever. It, it, uh, it, it, but it, the this initial thing of reacting to one another, at least we have that uh, to to deal with. Certainly Making... has incredibly how the technology has um, made some things impo- possible that wouldn't have been possible 10 years, 15 years ago. Can you imagine if this was 20 years ago in the oh industry? It, it, it's, it's almost unimaginable. I mean, the things we can do now with teleconferencing are pretty incredible. Yeah, it I... I wholeheartedly agree and and thank goodness that you know covid waited until this moment where we could have alternatives. <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, it's, it's it's astounding what we've all lost. I mean, and and the performances and the you know the debuts and all of us. I mean, every single one of us, from the youngest among us who your the students you serve in your academies and the people. I mean, it's just been such such a tough time. But but through these tough times, innovation does occur, and people who are the creative types are the be ones who are in there to make those innovations happen. Yeah, and I I have to say that I'm I'm very grateful to be working with uh, a company like LA Opera because. There are so many uh, talented individuals who are uh, really working together to uh, still figure out a way of reaching out, how how we can connect with our community, how we can connect with our art. Um, you know, what do we need to do to to be able to create art in this fashion? And uh, we we have. Uh, my boss, Stacy Brightman of LA Opera, she um, is an amazing person. I don't know if she ever sleeps because I say they're... the same thing about you. <laughs> <laughs> it well, must be I an LA thing. Sonia. Nobody sleeps, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's it's you know it's amazing how uh, some some people in our company have just. Um, understood where things were moving and started to engage the question um, how we can go into this direction. What do we need to do to meet the community, to uh, face the artists, uh, to deal with as many of the artists that are still working? Because I don't know about you, uh, but most artists on our side really got hit hard with this Same. and new york city has been shuttered broadway the met i mean uh, i i know so many of my colleagues met met soloists who are landscaping who are uh selling real estate i mean everything but singing these days yeah and and it's been really hard for us to see some of our friends who you know are fine artists but all of a sudden derailed uh, in a way where they have to focus on something else. And and so we have tried in every way possible to engage uh, engage our, our singers in uh, recitals uh, so that we can uh, have them sing in that fashion. We've created little uh, afternoon tea recitals, little storybook recitals, uh, all sorts of things. And, and with every one that we've done, we just like, yeah, this has to, we have to change. How do we do this? How, how can we create better video? How do we create better audio? How can we create better story in this fashion, which is much different than being on stage and creating story? And so finding that compelling narrative in the new video format. But if there's a place to do that, I would imagine Los Angeles is probably a great place with all the movie contacts. There must be <laughs> help yeah. out there. However, let me ask you this. Yes, we have great artists and we have many people who are very informed on how to create uh, art through film, through uh, video, through YouTube. Uh, we have all of that. However, how do you get a child 
to create art if they don't have those tools. Wow. If they don't have some, some of them don't even have a cell phone with a camera. They don't have a recording device. How do you create art at that point? And that, that was basically uh, part of my job is how do we create content that uh, a child who is not an artist can help also create the content along with us. And, and that so was I'll turn that around. Job. How do you, how did you do that? <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> um, it took us a little while to figure out what, everybody would have in common. So that would be um, most families have a cell phone and in the cell phone, they have a camera and a recording memo device. So we started off first of all with um, every summer we have what's called an opera camp. And that's any child who is interested in an intense uh uh, workshop situation for two to three weeks and they uh, come together uh, for rehearsal, learning music, learning staging. Well, this time uh, we invited people for a camp, but this was all going to be on Zoom. We had to limit because coaching people on Zoom for an hour, you could only do four to six individuals at the same time to make it engaging for everybody. So our limit was 24 per session. And then we're getting them uh, making sure that they have a cell phone, that they have a camera, that they have a background that would be appropriate. Um, and uh, then we started to create new content. Uh, we started at our summer camps, we have social justice issues that we try to address. And in this one, we started to address stories of uh, civic leaders in Los Angeles. So we were doing mm. LA stories and how that connected with music that we were already learning. So music from Brundibar, music from uh, uh, Friedel, music from uh, a, a couple of other one act operas that we have for opera camp. And we uh, actually started to break up these songs so that they are more solos. We have a few songs that could be done in chorus and then you get the audio you get video we separate them so that we can organize them as much as possible and we do a virtual choir um and everything is being done in-house so our uh, technical director is learning how to use adobe and learning how to edit and and another staff member is learning how to use pro tools and we are really creating uh, an, an editing department and creating content that way and and of course i was uh editing the the story and music along with stacy brightman who was uh creating stories from our civic leaders and everybody was working day and night um, to, to create this content. And it, we just basically snowballed from there. We just, uh, after opera camp, our third session, I think we, we nailed it, what we, what we wanted to do, what we needed to do. But then now, how do we do that for public school students? And how do we get them interested? So Stacy, right away, I think in May, decided we need a another opera designed for kind of a Zoom thing. I think I suggested that <clears throat> instead of doing like a virtual choir type of thing with a lot of kids, because their issue is that mom and dad are home doing Zoom meetings and their brothers and sisters are also in class. So you have five streams going on at the same time. The students are not even able to show their faces because video is just killing their feed. And, and so a lot of times we're trying to teach them where we can't even see them. And so we, we actually designed an opportunity in which we created a graphic novel. 
and we're going to be actually doing slideshows in this graphic novel. So our principles, we were asking for maybe, oh, probably about 120 pictures from them uh, to create this story. We decided to make it really short. So it's a 20 minute story, a 20 minute opera. And the kids, I, <laughs> what I learned was there's only so many pictures that kids can really take from their own cameras, but each of them, we asked for about 30 pictures from them. Um, and we compiled all of those, but it turned out because we don't do this with just one school. Um, in our high school projects, we do this project with 10 schools. So 30 times 10, I, I think in total, we had more than 3,500 pictures wow. that our editors were dealing with. So uh, when we did this for the elementary school, uh, we decided to make a cartoon and only ask for one picture per student because then in the elementary school we're we're getting them involved in opera uh but that's 15 schools in the elementary side wow. and so uh if we're asking for 30 pictures from elementary school kids it, it would be impossible so we asked for one picture which we would be using in groups and so we only had to deal now with 600 pictures as opposed to 3,500 pictures. <laughs> and we are creating graphic novels and you're listening to the opera with these, with these images as a slideshow type of thing. One and, thing you uh, didn't mention, Eli, was that you write some of these one act musicals, right? You write some of these one act <laughs> operas. And um, did you write the music to this one as well? Um, actually, yes. Uh, this one is, well, the high school show, uh, which was uh, the story of Ada Lovelace, was written by a, a composer named Judy Pan, uh, Bansal, Juhi Bansal. Uh, she's a fine composer um, and uh, did a really wonderful job for the students in the high school. The elementary school is a story that, yes, my brother and I wrote, um, and it is... Uh, uh, a play on <laughs> the Barber of Seville, but we oh, take we take the characters of the Barber of Seville and put them into colonial uh, revolutionary time. Uh, you know the colonies here, and uh, now we have the Barber of Seville uh, with actually Pierre Beaumarchais uh, aiding in the storytelling of of this in colonial times and yes it's called figaro's american adventure and mm. it is a cartoon it is actually a chuck jones type of cartoon uh and you are hearing rossini's music inside this chuck jones cartoon and uh yes my brother and i wrote that one and and this is the one that that the the elementary school kids are are singing and they they tend to have a lot of fun with it uh of course, because it is a cartoon. Well, and also you're directing and you're working with your brother. It must be a blast. Is that the first piece you've collaborated on with your brother? Yes, it was. And at, at that time, uh, I asked him to do the libretto for me. He was living in Paris at the time because he is an opera singer. And uh, he was surrounded by Beaumarchais uh, as an influence. And, and so he created a story with Beaumarchais. The hard part was uh, trying to communicate and trying to go back and forth with somebody who lived um, in Paris while I'm living here and we both have do, uh, opposing schedules. And so trying to come together, that was a, a big challenge for us. And along the way, we've learned how to, to create works uh, that are easier uh, to do in, in a function. So he'll do a little uh, a little section and I'll write a little section and that inspires him to write something more and then that inspires me to write and so we go back and forth and now we're we're you know passing files back and forth and recordings back and forth. Technology is wonderful nowadays. 
I really appreciate what technology can offer an artist nowadays. And so exciting that you can collaborate that way. And um, I look forward to seeing the. I can look forward to seeing the video. When, when will those videos be uh, released on LA Opera, and how can people see them? Um, you would probably have to go to our website, um, and you will. You can find them in the uh, in the community uh, link on laopera.org or yes laopera.org you will find like the outreach education programs and from there you can see uh content that that we have available and also main stage has quite a few uh pieces of, of new works that are available to watch and uh, yeah sign up to laopera.org and and there are lots of things that we're trying to connect with as far as um new content for our community. It's so wonderful that that LA Opera, a leading company in the world, puts so much so much effort into cultivating the community. I think that's so important, and especially that you you choose important social justice themes to program with these 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 kids. It shows that opera is not a museum piece; that it's a living, breathing art form that has so much to say today. Uh, yes, uh, I think that. And I think there are some really fine directors who find uh, classic pieces with content in it that does refer to social justice. And they they are really creating incredible productions based on what matters today. And I, I think that's a, a sign of great art that can throughout time uh, withstand, you know, subjects so that it is it is important to hear, it's important to touch people's hearts, even as time moves on. Those universal themes strike us uh, especially, but uh, but for a young person to see themselves represented, I think it's really important in the, in the arts. And we're seeing a real renaissance of that right now. Companies are really coming to terms with uh, racial justice and uh, these themes that are so that are really in the news these days. Yeah, I and. I think that it's been something that has not been talked about for a very long time, and it needs to be. I think it is a point of frustration for a lot of people who might be affected by um, the, the silence of certain topics. And so now people must speak. People must share their stories. People must experience. And, and hopefully in this, we feel that we are a part of a community that, that, you know, these people are not here and these people are here. We are one, we are connected and we are valuable for one another in this one world. Uh, and I, I, feel very blessed that I have a company uh, that I work with that actually addresses these types of things and challenges us to look at ourselves in this so that, you know, even though on a Sunday afternoon, I don't want to, uh, I, I have to grow. <laughs> I have to really think about these things and think how it changes me and, and what I must do. And when you're talking to a young kid who's going through some of these issues, uh yeah it, it becomes more important you know than than what i had imagined before well you touched the lives of so many people from the use all those elementary school people you never know who's gonna you know if they're just gonna learn to love music on their own or if they're gonna learn to be make music a part of their lives in a more more you know professional way you just never know but it's so important that everyone has access to the arts because it enables us to be more human it it does it does humanize us all, um, and even if we know that there's going to be a lot of people that we come in contact with that are not going to be professional artists, um, when we invite somebody to an opera camp, uh, we don't go there looking for the next you know young phenom or you know the the future opera singer of america we're not necessarily looking for that we're looking for somebody to join our community and sometimes uh you have a child whose parents are saying join you know try this for the summer you know do do this for the summer and they're like i just want to go to like engineers camp let me just go to space camp and they make deals i have actually one one student who wanted to go to an engineers camp he wants to be an engineer 
engineer. He still wants to be an engineer, but he took one camp and got so hooked that he constantly came back. And by the time he was 17, he had been with us for five years for every summer. And he told me in his audition that, um, no, he's, he's going to uh, Stanford, uh, f- you know, for engineering. And uh, he, he expects to be a, a contributor to the arts uh, based on his experience. And you know what? Yeah, the arts need contributors. And if we can get them early on just by uh, playing and torturing, <laughs> because let's face it, some of these things we do with our with our young friends uh, can be torture to some of them at first. It turns into fun, but at first it can feel a little bit like torture. But once it get, goes past that initial thing, yeah, they're they're having a great time and they are hooked. We have a question from the audience from Dan from Seattle. Uh, he's asking, um, how does someone who's young become a director? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. I, I think I was always uh, a, a director when I was a, a choir boy. When I was a choir boy, my favorite t- teacher, my mentor was a stage director. And whenever I could, I would hang out with Bob Rogers. And Bob Rogers would constantly tell my brother and I stories, our brother and me stories, and we were uh, just drinking it in. I think based on my experience with Bob Rogers, I was kind of destined to become a director, but it really didn't happen. I, I was actually, I studied in college to be a music teacher. And from there, I my journey. And you certainly are, choir. my friend. You certainly are. <laughs> I I try, but uh, really, it didn't come to. I didn't come to be a director until I, I became a, a Marilla participant, which is a summer program f- uh, at San Francisco Opera, and I was a singer, and. Uh, the year that I was uh, participating, they took a number of us on tour to Japan to perform La Boheme. And it was my job to be Benoit in Act One, the old landlord. Um, and my job... It's a lot of makeup. <laughs> it, it is a lot of makeup for somebody who is, what, 30, what, 33 at the time? Yeah, it was a lot of makeup. But... Uh, the. The, the thing was that I had a lot of free time. And so while the director was working with uh, one group of people, I was with the chorus and showing them when certain things were supposed to happen in the production. And he saw me working and told me, well, actually he told me, you should really focus as a director. Forget the singing stuff. You'll never make it. But, but you should be as a director um, because you really have a knack for it. And I, I thought about it, and uh, LA Opera gave me an opportunity to be um, a director in the outreach programs. And, uh, yeah, it was something that I stumbled onto, but it was an, uh, a natural thing for an educator, uh, you know, a music teacher who was very very adept on being on stage to then take that experience to be a director for children or for people who are rank beginners on stage. Isn't it amazing how that that right mentor points to that direction and all of a sudden it changes the whole perspective of your life. I had a similar experience with, um, I was doing my under, I was doing my master's degree in conducting as a music educator and the um, the director there said, you know, I, I wanted to be, a, I, I was a Copper Mario tenor singing small roles here and there all throughout <laughs> New York and uh, I, I wanted to be a tenor. He's like, you don't have a voice for that, but you'd be a great conductor. <laughs> I changed my life on a dime and everything started coming together and you just, it just changes your whole perspective on life and everything works and all my training as a singer is translated it's like oh i know i have thing i have a skill set that i can teach with my conducting exactly and and i tend to i tend to have a lot of fun i i am not i am not uh that 
I'm more irreverent when it comes to what happens on stage and the rehearsal process for an opera. I'm much more irreverent than, than trying to maintain a museum piece. And when I'm working with whether it's professionals or whether it's young individuals, um, I am very exploratory as to how how we can best tell a story from the perspective of the person who's on stage, from the actor's perspective. And um, I discovered this by working with my brother, who is, you know, a very experienced opera singer. Um, and he has his style of of being and i had to learn how to negotiate and how to bring out that part of his story and uh and so working with fine professionals like that um got me working with young individuals trying to bring the best out of them from what experience they have already Amazing. What's it like when you've done projects like you did with uh, James Conlon, who worked with your, your academies? What was it like to bring in one of the world's great maestros to these young people? Okay. Maestro Conlon is one who is very devoted to community outreach. Um, we have a program that is called the Cathedral Project, which was an idea of his. And he uh, wanted to bring together uh, amateur community groups to be able to perform with professional instrumentalists and professional singers. Um, the thing that I found right away, well, his reputation, he's very intense. Um, and it is true. Maestro Conlon can be very intense, but he is also very kind and nurturing to individuals who need to learn something. And he is very uh, direct in what one needs to learn. So when he's working with a young orchestra of nine to 17 year olds, uh, really being very direct on how certain things can be done and doing this in a matter of minutes is absolutely amazing uh what he can do and and i think it it requires somebody of that type of intensity to go from a rehearsal on main stage to an amateur rehearsal and 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 bring in the lightness um, and bring in the, the focus and concentration to, to be able to meet both what the amateurs need and what the professionals require all at the same time. What an incredible and, initiative that LA Opera created this and that, um, that was your composition, right? Um, one of them that we have in rep is a composition, Amazing. which is uh, a, a play off of the, uh, play of Daniel, uh, Ludus Danielis, uh, which is a 13th century liturgical play. Um, and we've modernized it and disnified it so that um, uh, the, the uh, community that would be coming in to watch this can actually uh, be affected by it and not necessarily have to learn uh, a new style, a 13th century style of chant. Yes, they're getting 13th century style of chant, but with music that actually can initially affect somebody without having to learn about 13th century music. Organum and uh, yeah, yes. not, not thrilling to any audience, exactly. <laughs> but it is beautiful. You know, it's beautiful. It's just, yeah, I think that's, that's really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to ask, what was it like having, um, writing a piece of music and having a great maestro like Conlon get up there and conducted? What, were you, what, would, what did it feel like to you as the director and the producer of this piece of music? What was it like having watching this piece come to life? Terrifying, actually. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I was asked to, to create this piece, it was um, basically in April, and it had to be done by September. And um, they asked me because I was aware of what the piece needed and they had to do something very quickly. So Conlon actually heard Friedel and thought that I did a very fine job with, with this one act precursor to uh, Brundebar uh, by Hans Krasse. 
And so he said, you know what, let's, let's let Eli do it. So I had to come, first of all, I had to translate the, the French Latin to English and that took a while, but then I started to uh, share some of the works uh, with the upper brass on main stage, and uh, they understood what I was going for, and they they liked the idea. So I I completed it in in about well, the translation of the of the text took maybe a month and a half because Latin is not my strongest point uh, for translation. So it took that long. And then I was, I was really done with the work in about two months. It was the first full orchestra piece that I've ever actually worked on. And uh, I was very grateful that, that Maestro Conan was patient with me because I think the first rehearsal that he had with the pr professionals, he discovered that violin one did not have measure numbers on the parts and he looked at me as like no no measure numbers and it's like i it's finale what yeah, the finale program didn't print it out yikes <laughs> yeah so th that's why it was kind of terrifying for me but uh what an it, incredible it was... experience what, what and then it um have you done that piece again or has that been done once have you brought that back uh actually it is part of the the rep for that festival uh, show for that uh, for the cathedral project it comes back every three to four or five years now uh, it was actually supposed to be done in 2020 uh, but we got a sidetracked uh, at that point and and now we are hoping to 2021 we're not going to have the cathedral project but 2022 uh, we're talking about uh having the cathedral project once again, and probably also having a premiere piece. Uh, it's too soon to really talk about what that is because it's still in the discussion stage, but uh, we're, we're very excited about that. But yes, uh, the Festival Play of Daniel should be coming back within a couple of years. It's exciting, and it's exciting to hear that there's pro projects on the nascent stage that are coming up, and uh, that you're getting ready to, to do some composing and directing. And what do you see as the next step in coming back? Uh, we're we're starting. The vaccines are unrolled. Um, I got mine today, actually. So they're starting. <laughs> I mean, I, I was a, I was part of a line. The line was around the block, but it was so efficient. There were so many volunteers and professionals directing. And I mean, what, this is on, I'm sure it's on a national scale. It's incredible. The um, People want to get back to um, to quote unquote normal, whatever that's going to be. What's that going to be for your company? Do you think? Um, we are definitely waiting for uh, more artists to get vaccinated so that we can have a, a safer environment. Uh, the unions, the musicians' unions, actors' unions have all created uh, a safe way of working together. Uh, so we will probably still be living in those uh, conditions where some of our, our works will be uh, guided by safe distance. Uh, I think directors who will be working have to actually design and create works that have that kind of uh, thought in mind. Um, and we are slowly planning on, on opening up. Um, I think for us, we are uh, doing another opera camp um, via Zoom, but we are probably going to have a second session. And depending on how society is along their vaccination process, we might open it up uh, to have certain rehearsals and filming um, in a space with a few people together. So we might get th uh, three or four principals together, create um, a, a video session in which we can record them working a scene. Uh, chorus would probably have to be done in a different fashion, um, but we're working on that. And, uh, you know, it, it may not be that we are live. It could be that we are are creating another graphic type of 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 story 
um, which would be actually fine for us as we start to open it up. And hopefully when we get to um, main stage and, and their season opener in September, uh, we, we will be able to be on main stage, not necessarily filling out the house, but uh, having a healthy audience and having live performances coming up this fall. Well, fingers crossed. Those are, that you know, I, so many of our colleagues are all looking forward to the next chapter. And I know I've been in touch with the European colleagues. They're all starting the play, those plans. And uh, we'll just keep our fingers crossed that these things unfold. And also success to you as you as you, you write the playbook on youth opera in America. And you, along with your colleagues at Los Angeles Opera, it's really, um, thank, you. thank you so much for joining us. How can people find out more about your work and so what you have coming up? Um, actually, right now, I am very focused in what we are doing at LA Opera. So you can actually go to laopera.org to the uh, education and community programs uh, link, and you will see you'll see works that I have created, and you'll see works that I have directed, and uh, you'll see other uh, wonderful little things that other artists that we have in our company. Uh, are doing at this moment and in the future. We just put that in the chat function so people can check that out. And thank you so much for joining us, Eli. Uh, continued success. And I look forward to working with you in, as the years and months go by. Definitely looking forward to that time. All the best, my brother. Take care. Take care. Thank you for joining us on Music Matters with Jason Chime. Please remember to like and subscribe to us on YouTube and uh, join us and share our videos on social media. We really appreciate that. We have another show coming up tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Mark Marco Perfetti, a wonderful indie uh, singer-songwriter who is um, all over YouTube and Spotify. He'll be joining us. And uh, thank you for joining us. And remember, keep music alive.